I'd ask if you would turn in your Bible to Psalm 133, the 133rd Psalm. And I'm going to speak about something that is uh, relatively straightforward, just looking at the three verses in this psalm. Let me read it first for you. Psalm 133, the Bible says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Uh, anytime I'm asked to preach or teach at a place other than where I'm just going through a book study, I always want to consider what do the people need? What do we most need? And I'm convinced that this is a message that we need in 2021 as we just consider the state of not just New Testament, but just churches similar to it. Small, conservative, independent, sovereign grace Baptist churches. What do they need? And I'm convinced that they don't necessarily need another sermon on the five points right. or uh, another message about uh, how we need to, to be more conservative than we already are. I, not that those things shouldn't be rehearsed in our hearing. They should, and we shouldn't forget those things. But what do we need? Mm -hmm. What do I need? What, what, what message do I need? And I'm convinced that this is something I need. And so if you're wondering who I'm preaching to, I'm preaching to me first, or I'm teaching to me first. And if, if you can get a blessing out of it, then that uh, is, is the Lord's doing and not mine. So um, the psalm, of course, speaks of the topic of unity. Mm -hmm. Unity. Christian unity. And I, I've broken this three-verse psalm down into two very simple headings. So first I want you to see the blessing declared. The blessing declared. The blessing mm -hmm. of unity declared. Unity is spoken of as both good and pleasant. The Bible says, behold, and, and in the English it's hard to, to portray this, but this is a very emphatic statement. It's got an exclamation mark at the end of it, in fact, and exclamation marks in the 1600s were used far more sparingly in the English language than we use them today. I know I myself, especially in just in texts and emails, I use the exclamation mark all the time, and really I'm not shouting and screaming from the rooftops, but in the 1600s, that's what an exclamation mark meant. You're right. shouting and you're screaming from the rooftops. And so he says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. It is good and pleasant. Mm -hmm. Unity is a very precious gift. Unity is a very uh, blessed <laughs> privilege. Unity is a gift of God's grace and yet, we spend very little time thinking about how to maintain it. Right. And we spend very little energy trying to develop it. Amen. It's kind of like we view unity as if, well, we'll do what we want to do, how we want to do it. And if we can do it in unity, good. But if not, whatever. Hmm. And sometimes I think our priorities are a little flipped around when it comes to the subject of unity. And I think our churches are suffering because of it. Right. Unity is good because it reflects God's heart and God's purpose. There is unity in the Godhead, mm -hmm. the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, they are in unity with one another, in perfect unity. No division, no schism, no, no rift in the Godhead. And so we are most like God when we are united with one another. Mm -hmm. And we are most unlike God when we are bound up in division and strife. And it is pleasant because it is a picture of Christ's relationship with us. The Bible speaks of salvation as being united in Christ, having union with Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, sinners cannot naturally have union with Christ. Amen. So Jesus shed his blood. He died on the cross. He gave his life to atone for our sins so there could be unity. And he prays for his disciples. Father, I pray that they might be one unity, even as we are one. And of course, he's not speaking about one in person, right. because the Father and the Son are not one in person. They're two persons, but they're one in will. They're one in motive. 
They're one in direction. They're one in outlook. They desire the same things. They want the same things. They're working for the same goal. That's why the doctrines of grace are so beautiful, because in the doctrines of grace, we have God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three persons of the Godhead, all working to achieve the same thing. Amen. In the Arminian gospel, you have the Father looking down the corridors of time and choosing those he foresees believing, but then you have the Son coming and dying for all, whether they were chosen or not, and then you have the Spirit coming in and trying to work with a, a group that's kind of in between, who audibly hears the gospel with no effectual call, so you have disharmony in the Godhead, but we believe that the Father chose a group, the Son died for the group, and the Spirit is applying salvation to that group. It's Amen. the same people from eternity past to eternity future, and there's unity in the Godhead. Amen. And that is how we as God's people ought to be as we serve Him and as we carry out what He has called us to do. We should be united. And so unity is good and pleasant. And now we see who who the object of this unity is to be. He says, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And when he says brethren, he's not referring to your physical brothers and sisters. So we should try to have unity right. with our family, but oftentimes unity with our spiritual family will cost us unity with our physical family. Right. But it is that unity with our spiritual family that we are to seek above all things. Brethren refers to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, if you look at your superscription on this psalm, it says a song of degrees of David. Now, the songs of degrees or psalms of ascent, they were the psalms that were to be sung as Israel journeyed to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. So the primary emphasis is worship. Worship is the primary emphasis, but he doesn't say how beautiful it is when brethren worship together in unity. He says it's beautiful when brethren dwell together in unity. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, because if you're not dwelling together in unity, you cannot worship together in unity. There is nothing more hypocritical than running others down, talking about them behind their back, putting down their churches, putting down their pastors, and then meeting once a month for a fellowship and trying to worship together. Mm. If we're not dwelling together in unity, we can't worship together in unity. Right. And it doesn't matter how sound our doctrine is or how good our preaching is or how wonderful our singing is if it's done in hypocrisy because we really don't love the people that we're singing with and worshiping with and praying with. David knew that God's people could not worship together if they did not dwell together in a spirit of unity. And unity requires submitting ourselves one to another and preferring our brother before ourselves. Mm -hmm. if, if we always want to have the preeminence, if we always want it to be our way or the highway, if we always think we're right about everything and everyone else needs to come around to my side of things, we're never going to have any unity. Amen. If we come to church with our five points polished and shined and we're ready to browbeat anybody who would dare question anything we have to say, <coughs> we're not united. Amen. We're divisive. We're contentious. Now, understand what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we should sacrifice sound doctrine for the sake of unity. I'm not saying we should sacrifice truth for unity. It's not what I'm saying. But I do believe that, that there is a way for Christians to disagree with one another and still have Christian unity. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that there is a peaceful way to depart from other believers and draw away from other believers that does not necessarily create disunity. There, there are some times in which we will just have to say to someone, I can go this far with you, but no further. I'm, I, I'm sorry. And, you know, we, we, we practice that, don't we? Like when it comes to, for instance, supporting missionaries. Just because we might not have enough, because we can't go beyond what the Lord allows us to do in our own conscience. So just because we might not have enough liberty to to support a missionary or to, to financially endorse the work, that doesn't necessarily mean that we think it's just of the devil and it just needs to be thrown into the fire. Right. Just because we might not feel comfortable having a certain brother come and preach in the pulpit does not mean we think he's a raging heretic. Right. But yet, oftentimes, that's how we talk about people. 
It's how we treat others. And you'll, you'll, you'll see in different groups where, especially preachers, and I guess I'm speaking this way just because I've, I've been around that, but you're almost afraid to say something good about someone because you know they're not in the crowd. Right. And if you say something like, well, I heard such and such preach a good message, you're, you're afraid that you'll be lumped in the crowd. And, and, you know, I just don't think the Lord is really pleased with all of that. Right. When you, when you read especially texts like 1 Corinthians, which is what I'm preaching through on Sunday evenings in Paris, where Paul says, whether we water or whether we labor or whatever our role is in the ministry, all the ministers are one and every man shall receive his own reward. So trying to pit a God-called minister against another God-called minister is trying to pit God against himself and that's not going to happen. Right. And because of our fallenness, because we live in this in-between where we're saved and we're we're being sanctified, but we're not yet glorified. None of us have it all put together. Right. And so at times we have to say, well, brother, this is what I believe is, is true. And this is what you believe is true. And, and obviously we have this disagreement. And so we might have to step away. We might have to, to, to go our separate ways as Paul and Barnabas did or as Paul and John Mark did. But that doesn't mean we necessarily have to condemn one another as false teachers and heretics and, right. and just good for nothing. And I think that kind of mentality is what is destroying unity. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it's just preachers and, and, and pastors that do this. I think other Christians do this to one another. Right. Well, if, if you don't dress like our church dresses, or if you don't uh, practice this particular thing, or if you don't do this particular thing, well, we don't want anything to do with you. And again, I'm not saying we tear down walls. I'm not saying we compromise truth. I'm just saying we should at least consider and endeavor as much as possible to have unity. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't boast about, bragging about. I think there's, there's people that they, they almost think they're more spiritual if they can find reasons to disfellowship with people. Hmm. <laughs> And if you fellowship with someone, that must make you unspiritual. But it's kind of like, uh, I, I, knew a, I knew a brother, and I can't even remember the issue, but um, he, and he had invited a guest pastor to come preach at his church. And, um, and he preached a meeting for him or whatever, and then after the meeting was over, the, the preacher, the one that the guest preacher came in, he said to the host pastor, he said, now you know, brother, he said, I don't have no problem coming and preaching for you. He said, but you know, I could never... Uh, extend the same invitation to you because of this issue. I don't know what it was. I can't remember. And the brother looked at him and he said, he said, yeah, I know that. He said, I guess I'm just more spiritual than you are. <laughs> but I think he's right. I think he's right. And I know it wasn't a major, it wasn't anything like denying the gospel or anything like that. It was one of those secondary issues that we like to make tests of fellowship out of. But I think that we're missing out when we do that. We are missing out on the blessing of unity. This is the blessing that God wants his people to have. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And I want you to see now the blessing described. The blessing described. It says in verse 2, It is like, unity is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Now, we learned a couple of things from this verse. Number one, we learned that Aaron had a pretty long beard. Right. Okay, we learned that because it's going down to the skirt of his garments. So that thing must have been hanging pretty low. But we also see in this figurative language, so the Psalms, of course, they're, they're, they're literature, they're Hebrew poetry. We see how beautiful this thing of unity is when we have it. It's described as precious ointment. The oil used for anointing priests and art and articles in the tabernacle. That's what's being described here. Uh, turn over to Exodus chapter 30. Because if, if you're reading this, especially in, in the New Testament, and not the New Testament in the text, but we all live in the New Testament. We are under the New Covenant. And reading that under the New Covenant, we, we're like, what do you mean the, the oil that flowed down from his beard? We don't, we don't do that anymore. So we have to, we have to see what, what is David talking about. Exodus 30, look at verse 22. It's a kind of a long portion, but I want you to see it all. Verse 22, he's going to talk about the holy anointing oil that was exclusively used of the priests in the temple. 
Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even two hundred and fifty shekels, and of sweet calamus, two hundred and fifty shekels, and of cassia, five hundred shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of the oil of olive and hen, and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound, after the art of the apothecary, it shall be an holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table of all his vessels, and the candlestick of his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels, and the labor of his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them, that they may, that they may be most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them, that shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it be poured. Neither shall ye make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall be cut off from his people." So we see how precious this oil is. We see how special this oil is. We see how exclusive this oil is. And from that, I think we learn that Christian unity is this, this special thing that only God can give and really can only be experienced by Christians. Mm -hmm. if, if you are a believer, I think you will understand that the most precious relationships that you will ever know between other human beings will always be had between those who share your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That is, a, it's true for my life because I did not grow up in a family where I had close familiar relationships nor a family of believers. But the family of God that I was birthed into has given me stronger bonds and stronger relationships than any physical family could have ever given me. Amen. How much more so it, it is strong when the physical family and the spiritual family are one and the same. That is, right. that is a real blessing. But it's this precious ointment. It is special. It is valuable. Notice that it says that it ran down Aaron's beard. It, it was abundant. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was normal. It was natural. Sometimes we think, we think as if like unity, it's kind, of, it's kind of like this special thing that we get every once in a while when really unity should be the status quo. Unity should be which is what we naturally experience. And when there's ununity, we should, we should stop everything we can and figure out why there is this ununity and work and endeavor to maintain it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think we're all too satisfied to just not even try to reconcile differences. Mm -hmm. We can all think of grudges that right. Christians are holding between one another from something that, that a sin that was committed in 1987 and the families haven't spoken to each other since. Mm. Even when there is some kind of uh, reconnection with that relationship, we, we still we want to hold these grudges. We want to, uh, you know, I'll never walk too closely to them again because of this thing that they did. Well, that's inhibiting unity. It's inhibiting unity. And the Lord wants us to be one. Amen. Jesus prayed in John 17. He prayed for his disciples. He said, I don't pray for the world, but I pray for them which you have given me out of the world that they may be one. When we are unified, when we are together, we are an answer to the prayer of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a glorious thought. And then he says in verse 3 that unity is as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. This is referring back in Deuteronomy. As the people of God were on Mount Hermon and the dew came down to refresh them. So unity is, is so refreshing that it is as if God causes dew to fall on all of us. What does the Amen. Bible say? Love covers a multitude of sins. Mm -hmm. Unity covers a multitude of sins. Amen. When we have true unity, we're not going to be so nitpicky about all these little things. Which most of them, I don't know about most of them, but a lot of them are not even necessarily sins against God. It's just sins against our personal pet peeves, mm. our personal beliefs or practices. Whenever, whenever you hear someone say something like, well, I know the Bible's 
doesn't condemn it, but I just think, well, just stop right there. You're, you're going beyond what is written, and you're imposing something on someone that the Bible doesn't impose, and you're wrecking unity for your own personal tastes. Mm-hmm. And I'm preaching it myself this morning. I do this. And it's costed me relationships with people that it shouldn't have to cost me relationships with. Mm-hmm. And it's hindered me from being able to work with people that could be a great blessing to me. Mm-hmm. And I know I've been on the other end of it, but I really don't have any kind of room to talk right. if I'm not checking my own heart on this issue. We should desire this unity. And again, I, I feel like I have to put in these disclaimers, unless I be misunderstood, although I don't think I'm being misunderstood. I'm not saying we should yoke up with just any you know, Joe Blow preacher that we find on the street, no matter what he preaches or anything like that. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that in the spirit of Christian charity, should we not seek as much as possible to be unified, to work together? Mm -hmm. You know, if if we were to meet, ask yourself this. This is a good way to kind of examine your own heart. If you were to meet another believer and they were to tell you, oh, yeah, I'm I'm a Christian too. What would be your initial reaction? Would you say, wonderful, you're a believer too. We, We both are Christians. Or would you say, well... Let me, let me see how you look. Let me see how you talk. Mm. Where do you go to church again? And you're, you're, you're asking all these questions because in your mind, you're not going to receive their, their profession of faith until you've given them this little middle test and they, they check all the boxes. And then even after that, you're still going to watch them for a little while before you will really embrace them in Christian unity. Really, that's a privilege that I think we, we have in America that they don't have other places in the world. I was listening to a testimony of a missionary in Peru, and he was talking about how they were in this really a crime-infested area, and a, a, a cartel fight had broken out, and they were kind of hiding uh, off in a, in a location, and they were trying to get from one village to the other, and they finally make it to this other village, and they, they come up to the first house they can find, and a woman comes to the door, and they ask her in Spanish, um, are there any brothers here, hermanos, are there any brothers here? And she says, yes, I know where there are some Christians. And she takes them to a Christian house, and they go in, and they're having a meal. Do you think they stopped to have this theological examination before they embraced each other as brothers and sisters in Christ? Right. I don't think they did that. I think that they had unity there. And so I I think that should be our our natural default. Now, when we see serious problems that conflict with the profession, I think we absolutely, yes, we should begin to question and we might even begin to, to not even believe that profession, okay? So I'm not, I'm not saying we should just give everyone the benefit of the doubt until they just pull a total Judas Iscariot. But whatever happened to, you know, treat others as you would have them do unto you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would hope that if I meet someone and I tell them, Yes, I'm a, I'm a believer. I, I work out of a church plant in Paris. I hope that they would say, wow, praise the Lord. It's great to meet you. I hope mm-hmm. they wouldn't say, well, hmm, let me think about that. Right. Because I know my faith. I know that, I know that I'm, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I would hope that they would receive that without giving me an ordination exam. You know, we, we like to remember when Jesus said, If they're not for us, they're against us. Hmm. We like to remember that verse. But we like to forget about that passage where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, there's some that are preaching about you, but they're not not with us. Jesus says, well, they're not against me. Right. They're for me. Paul said in the New Testament, some, and I'm going to misquote this, but he says, some preach Christ out of strife and contention, Seeking to add affliction to my bonds. So they were preaching Christ simply to to get Paul in even more trouble. Mm -hmm. But yet Paul said, wherever Christ is preached, therein I rejoice. Amen. And Paul did not say, I'm going to go yoke up with them and join them. And stand, stand side by side with them and join their church and put my full stamp of approval on their ministry. He didn't say that. But he said, hey, if they're preaching Christ... Preach Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen. You know, it was a convicting story that I heard a brother tell. He, he said, um, 
he was at a Banner of Truth, you know, the publisher Banner of Truth. He was at a Banner of Truth conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And he said that the, the speaker was preaching on this subject of Christian unity. And, and it was mainly pastors there. So he had a real pastoral uh, emphasis. And he, he said, he said, if you were converted under a five-point Calvinist, sovereign grace preacher, stand up. And out of two, three hundred men, maybe 10, 15 stood up. Right. And then he said, if you were converted under a maybe a four point or an Arminian or a Southern Baptist or maybe not even a Baptist preacher, church, stand up. Hundreds of men stood up. Right. Now, none of them were still in that camp. But the point was, God was pleased to use men outside of their camp. Mm hmm. And how are we ever, because all of those men came to the truth eventually on those issues, but how are we ever going to be used by God to help those come to those truths if we just want nothing to do with them? Right. Bad mouth them, call them names, yeah. mock them, make jokes about them. And I get it. Some of the jokes are funny, to be honest with you. But sometimes I have to really check my heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, I, if I'm in Paris... And I'm ranting and raving about the Campbellites all the time. The Campbellites, the Campbellites. Well, when I have somebody that attends the Church of Christ that doesn't even know what a Campbellite is, and I just scoff at them and say, oh, you're just a Campbellite, how am I ever going to be able to reach them with the truth? Mm -hmm. I, we, I, Abigail and I have a friend that, we, that we've met. He lives here in Dover, and uh, he works in Paris. And we, we befriended him and his children, and he... Came over to our house last week for a meal, and he nominally attends the Church of Christ. I've had conversations with him. He, he's not uh, too familiar with his with even what his own church teaches, right. though I can tell he uses the phrase phraseology. And he was asking me a little bit about what we believe, and I was explaining it. It was totally new to him. He's never attended a Baptist church, and he asked if we had instruments, and I said, "Yeah, we use a piano." And he said, "Well, you know," he said, "I never quite understood why." Uh, they wouldn't allow us to use pianos or anything. He said, I've always loved to listen to hymns on the piano. And so I'm just talking with him back and forth. Now, I guess if I was a really good Baptist, I would have nothing to do with him, right? I would just, yeah, just, hey, don't come into my home. I'm not even going to wish you Godspeed. Would, is that what God would have me to do? Is that what Jesus would have me to do? Hmm. Now, I'm not going down there when he goes to the Church of Christ and sitting alongside him and putting my arm around him and hmm. hanging out with him down there. You know, he's probably there right now. But I, I just pray that as the Lord has allowed us to befriend one another, that maybe I'll be able to minister to him in some way and help him to come along to, to see some of the things that the Lord has allowed me to see. Bad. And if it wasn't for the Lord revealing those things to me, I'd probably be down there next to him, just as blind. Right. You know, I gave him one of our church tracts, and he said, he'll come and visit us some Sunday. Praise the Lord. You bet. Praise the Lord. That is the kind of unity that we should want. Turn to John 15, if you would, and we'll close. Note in Psalm 133, he compares unity to everlasting life. He says that the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. That's how precious unity is. In heaven, there will be no disunity. Amen. And I think that I think that some of us are going to feel really silly when we are worshiping in heaven next to someone that we wouldn't even talk to on earth. Hmm. John 15, look at verse 9. The Bible says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept the Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. Now this is what I want you to see. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that our joy will not be full unless we are loving one another as he has loved us. Amen. We don't experience the fullness of our joy in Christ if we don't have unity. 
See, Christianity is not so much about a personal relationship as it is the people of God as a whole coming together to worship Him as a body. That's why we believe so strongly in the importance of the local church. If, if all you do is have a personal relationship and you just sit on your couch and watch church on TV, you're missing out big time on the blessings that God has for your life. Yeah, Christianity is about God's people coming together. In the Old Testament, it was not about individual Israelites. It was about Israel, the nation as a whole. And in the New Testament, it's about churches and groups and people and communities and families. Think about what, what Christians are likened to. They're likened to a body. Mm -hmm. They're likened to a bride. They're likened to, they're likened to uh, members of a building. All things that must require multiple people to make them up. That is the unity that we're supposed to have. So I think that we ought to be careful to, as much as we can, maintain and seek after and chase after this unity. Amen. And as I was th thinking about some of these things, and, and really this is, this is something that I, I wish I could have had more time to, to put into, but it was just something that's been on my heart and mind recently. You know, and since moving up to Tennessee, Abigail and I have got to learn a lot about the Amish. So we don't really have any Amish in Georgia. But we've got to learn a lot about them. And it's a fascinating subject to me, so I always like asking Larry and Donna questions about them and just learning different things that they do and everything. And you know, one of the things I've learned about the Amish is that they don't care how you dress, how you talk, how you drive, what you do, as long as you're not Amish. If you're not Amish, come by their house, they'll sell you, they'll sell you produce, they'll talk to you, they'll befriend you, and you can you can dress however. I mean, uh, I'm usually pretty conservative, and I felt like a liberal when I went to go visit the Amish community because I was wearing jeans and a polo shirt. And I felt like I was, had a cell phone, you know, and I felt worldly. <laughs> but once you, once you join the church, see, once you join the church, then you better start keeping all the rules. Mm -hmm. You better toe the line. You better walk the walk. You better talk the talk. You better look the look. Or you will be shunned. No. And they will have nothing to do with you. Now, shouldn't it be shouldn't it be opposite? I mean, I'm not saying we should shun unbelievers, but if if there's anybody that we're gonna try the, our hardest to get along with, shouldn't it be other Christians? Mm -hmm. Yet no, we do the exact same thing the Amish do. Mm -hmm. Because you have people that you work with. You have people that you see every day as you're going to the store, as you're going about your business. You have friends that you know, and they're not in one of your type, your kind of churches. And so they dress differently. They talk differently. They, they read an ESV and not a King James. They, they have different views about different things. And, and you're friends with them. You love them. It doesn't really even inhibit your friendship. You're able to talk with them and communicate with them and get along with them. But then when you have a, a professing believer... When you have someone one that, that you should be even more united to, suddenly you, you start to scrutinize and we start yeah. to we start to hold them to a standard that we don't even hold unbelievers to. Right. And I, I think this is a difficult issue, and I don't profess to and I don't think the Bible even gives us a clear cut rule. Uh, different people will have different liberties as to who they're able to associate with and fellowship with. And different churches will have different liberties as to what other churches they're able to fellowship with. And that, it's like many things in the Christian life. The Bible doesn't give us a clear black and white rule. If it did, you know, we would probably love that because it wouldn't require very much work. But I think we need to start prioritizing unity more than we do. Especially when you consider all of the evils in society. You're bad. We're living in a country where 70 million babies have been murdered in the womb just in the last 40 years. We're living in a country where 20 years ago, even unbelievers believed that sins like homosexuality were immoral and even disgusting. And even unbelievers thought that it was shameful to shack up and to live with someone you weren't married to. But now, those sins are paraded around in our country as right. the way to go. Yep. But yet, even though we have other Christians that would agree with us and stand with us in that fight, we won't... We won't work with them because of other subsidiary issues. And some of us, you know, it's like we want to have our circle so small that we cut off our own toes. Mm. 
And I, I think I can say that here because I don't worry about this church going the liberal, immodest, carnal, sensual route. And there's things that can be preached here that would flabbergast other churches because you're accustomed to it. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But I think as we hammer down on those issues, as we should, we need to also seek as much as we can to maintain unity. So I don't know if this was helpful. Hopefully I didn't, yeah. hopefully I didn't overstep uh, in any way. But I, I, I know that, tr believe me, brothers and sisters, this is something that I need to be mindful of in my own personal life. And I hope that we all pray for one another, that we would be unified and that we would pray uh, that the Lord would help us to strengthen those bonds with other Christians and other believers. We so desperately need it in the day and age in which we live. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your goodness to us. We ask that you would be pleased to bless us and to help us unify your people, strengthen us, put us together, Lord, and help us in, uh, to maintain the bonds of unity through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.